Thanks everyone coming. Uh, this is tracing related. It's actually more somewhat um, uh, safety critical validation using the tracers. Um, so this is on the runtime uh, verifier written by Daniel Bristop. Um, so, sorry. So what is the runtime uh, verification? So basically the idea is this. Uh, you create a model in, you know, you look, you, you figure out what your system is. And you're going to create some sort of model using uh, Autonoma and a state machine. Uh, you write it up in a special format, you're going to compile it, and then you're going to put it into the kernel. It's going to hook to trace points. So the only thing that this is really related to tracing is it uses trace points. Okay, there's no F, tra F trace itself, although we have F trace is sometimes used in some other things, or LTTNG or perf or anything. No, it's actually using the trace point uh, infrastructure. Okay, so I'm going to go in for terminology, because some people get confused, like, well, what's the difference between a trace point and trace event? A trace point is just the hook in the kernel. There's nothing exported. When you look at TraceFS, you don't see trace points. You see trace events. Trace events are infrastructure that hook to trace points. When you create a trace event, the trace event creation will create a trace point that it's going to use. So like the sked switch trace event is what creates the sked switch trace point, which is what you put in the kernel. So inside the scheduler, you'll see trace sked switch. That is a trace point. All it does, and this is mostly Matthew's uh, uh, work, is it will, that's the, the uh, what's called the static branch or jump label. So when it's off, it's a no-op. It's seriously uh, a five byte, on x86, five byte no-op. And when you enable it, it, it gets, turns into a jump. So it's, there's no conditional branch. Unless you don't, unless you go into your menu config and you say disable static branch, which I'm going to talk about just to say. recipes, go on. So, so I participated in the uh, initiation of those ideas, put the people together, but I'm not the one who did the uh, compiler implementation in ASM Go2 and all that stuff. Oh, no, 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 I'm saying, no, no, uh, you're, you basically wrote, you, I'm saying that you're, okay, the static branch, I didn't say, that's static yeah. branch. Yeah. No, I'm saying the trace point infrastructure yeah. is which is, has the RCU do trace and all that lovely stuff. I mean, you and I worked quite a bit together on that one. But no, the, uh, that's like Peter Zilstra helped a lot in the uh, trace point. So basically, a static branch, I mean, the ASM go to that's in uh, GCC and, uh, and Clang and everything and that came from this uh, idea because we had trace points all over, trace points started growing all over the uh, kernel and we're like we need to you know make this faster so you know, we need a way to put in a no op but you can't go in ASM and have a jump to a label from ASM what because GCC could do some really crazy things so we need a way to tell GCC that this ASM this because uh, to in GCC if you do an ASM it's just some blind, it doesn't know what it is. You, you can do whatever you want. So if you have a jump, you have to have a constraint there that says, hey, here's a label that this code or this asm block blob might go to. So GCC knows. So what we do is we put a just five byte no-op, and then later on we dynamically change that to the jump to the label. And so there's no, it doesn't bother the branch predictor and stuff like that. And uh, uh, it has like, by the way, if you turn off static um, branches, I found out that's like, and then just run your like hack bench and stuff like that, it's like a 5% slowdown. So it's, I mean, at last I did a, a thing on that. So, so it's a very, very fast thing, but yes. But it's not only used for trace points nowadays. There are many fast paths that use ASM. Oh yeah, yeah, no, yeah. like basically KVM, you know, when you move, boot up KVM, something like that, but that's, that's going off. Anyway, for the runtime verifier, um, it's very, very fast. So when we have a jump, you jump directly in and then we go into uh, the trace point infrastructure that could do callbacks. So that's just a trace point set, just a way to do callbacks randomly in some static point in uh, the kernel. K probes is a way to dynamically do it. K probe is where you say put a probe, um, where it just says jump to some code at some random spot in the kernel. So uh, Daniel Brista, uh, through his PhD and stuff like that, came up with the idea of you know, using this information to validate the running of the um, kernel. And what you do is you create the autonoma, you compile it, and it will load it as a module. It would register to trace points and sometimes K probes, and then it would create a state machine. And when you get the information back from the state machine, it would just move it to the next state and move it to the next state and move it to the next state in your model. And if there's ever a time you go to a state that's invalid, then you do a trigger. And there's, he has, uh, you could do just a print K, a warning, 
you could crash a machine. So the uh, automotive industry is very much using this um, to validate. Uh, so they put this in, and what it does is like for autonomous driving, and if it's constantly making sure that the kernel is doing what it expects to do, and in any case that it says, oh wait, this isn't what we want to do, crash, it actually panics the kernel, because that will put it into a safety mode. And so basically it will you know, let you pull over nicely. So, like I said, it starts off with the uh, Autonoma uh, Discrete Event System. So if you remember your CS uh, courses back in you know, college and all that, um, I used to love these things back then, but since it's been like 30 years since I've been to college, uh, I don't remember it. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, here's the workflow, as I mentioned. So you create this dot file that he has a way of turning it into some code that you put up and then you compile it, load it into the module, and this is how it works. So for, he has an example in there called WIP. And I keep saying, is it work in progress? Um, it's like the worst acronym. I, it's, it's a joke, and he just left it there just because he just loved to troll us. Um, so work in progress, no it's not. It's um, wake up and preempt. So here's the, uh, the, the very, very simple example. You know, the idea is, you, like when you have um, uh, preemption enabled, you want to know like, hey, I want to record like, you know, um, if, I do, if I have a wake up in a preempt section, I better not schedule. So he actually says, okay, so I, have, I keep track of my state, whether I'm preempt or non-preempt. Preempt, non-preempt. So that's basically, he has this little thing, like so every time, you know, if you're preempt enable, preempt disable with a flag of the counter, so if the, you know, the, it could actually, probably should put, it should be like, uh, non-preempt could stay in there as well. I should have, he probably should have had that in there where you could go from non-preempt to non-preempt if the counter's up there, but anyway. Um, and when a sked wake happens, um, it has to, it can't, it better go back to the preempt section. It doesn't get out. So. Um, I don't know how easy you could read that. The font isn't the best. But this is the dot file that represents that information. It's not that easy to understand. In fact, this is one of my asks, because I said, where do we have to go from here? One of the problems with things like this is, you know, when you, if you have something that's complex, no one will use it. Um, this is one of the things he was working on. He was working on trying to ha have ways of making this easier to write. And, um, I'm almost asking if anyone knows or, or of helping uh, ways to say, hey, I could use like a diagram and make this like make this like easier to write because this is this is the work in progress. It's a very simple thing, but there's still quite a bit of code there or um, uh, sanitation. So he has uh, inside um, uh, the yep. Oh wait wait yep yes. I think there are. Um applications to actually, from a graphical representation to actually produce the dot file. Okay. Um, yeah, I think there are, but. Hold on to that, you might be needed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I asked him to be my backup, because uh, honestly, um, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, <laughs> like I would, I said, I, know what, I trust you, Daniel. Uh, so I didn't really review it as much as I should have. <laughs> <laughs> kind of the same situation, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so to enable like this, if you go into like uh, kernel hacking, tracers, runtime, there's a, you can enable runtime verification and this is the menu for runtime verification. Um, the code is already in there for the um, work in progress. Um, so this is the module code uh, that you have inside. So you run the uh, little, uh, what, let me go back there. Yeah, so this is actually, when I ran his script, like in the tools, or was it, yeah, it's tools verification directory. Uh, he has, um, this is a Python script, uh, I believe that you could just run on a dot file, that first dot file, it creates this file. It's the uh, code, I think it's almost pretty much complete that, that's up there. So it's not, like, it creates the code for you, and this becomes like the header file for your module. And when you go into your, like, so if you want to create a module to put it in, um, here's the module, you go, you include that header file, and it's not, this is actually really simple code. You just have to go here and attach the um, uh, trace 
the, what's it called? You want to attach the trace points to your callback functions in your module. So it's a little bit of manual stuff, but this is kind of, it's all very much, it could definitely be automated. All this could easily be automated. Right now it's done by hand, but it's not, it's just basically just, I need to do X, need to do Y. So it's not something that um, takes really much brain thought, thought to do. It's just making sure you do it correctly. It's so something that could definitely be automated. Uh, here's the second part of the module. And when you execute it, that's all it is. So I um, think it's like my, actually my last slide because uh, this is where I kind of like want a discussion and stuff like that is where do we go from here? Um, this is, I believe, um, work that will be uh, extremely useful. So uh, actually, uh, uh, Alexander Arling, the one that gave uh, the talk earlier today, uh, he actually came to me uh, uh, after one of our tracing uh, meetings, like, Steve, I have a question for you. Uh, I need a way to verify DRM. And I was thinking, you know, hey, it would be great if I hooked to the trace points and have some way to, you know, as it's going through and running and validating the trace points uh, or validate, validating the DRM code through the trace points. And I'm like, you just described a runtime verifier. <laughs> he didn't know about it. So he looked into it and he's like, actually, this is, he's like, this is great because like, I don't have to write the code. I could just use this. So he's working on it. So if there's anything like in the kernel that you want to do verification of, so you could validate this. And by the way, in his PhD, Daniel's PhD, he verif uh, basically he successfully proved the correctness of the scheduler. So the Linux scheduler has been proved correct after he fixed two bugs in the process. So his verifier found two bugs in the scheduler that, because when he said, like, wait a minute, this isn't right. So basically, he validated that it was incorrect. And he sent it. It was like little, it was really, really subtle bugs. And then when he sent it to Peter Zillstrap, he was like, yeah, that's a bug. And he fixed it. So he actually found two different bugs while validating the uh, scheduler. So people said, you know, like, the Linux kernel is too complex to validate. Well, we got a methodology to kind of kind of do that for us now. Um, so I guess, Yuri, you said that there's already... Um, application yeah. for the dot files then? I, I believe there are. Uh, I believe while essentially studying uh, the stuff that uh, I saw them mentioned. So that, that's one thing. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if there are kind of open source, maybe to, like tooling used by mm -hmm. the uh, researchers for kind of working on automata. So they might be interested. If they are not, of course, to have something open source that does that. Um, yeah, um, I guess continuing on, on to like ongoing or interesting things to, to do. You mentioned the BPF. So Daniel has uh, a, already a repository with an auto three implementation of the dot two BPF. So instead of creating a module, you create a essentially BPF instrumentation and then you load into the kernel and then you get the same results. Yeah, so, so um, but there was, I remember the, the Exist City fixed the issues because I mean, when he first did that, so everyone says, well, why don't you do some BPF? And he said I, he tried, but it was extremely difficult and he couldn't quite get it right. Uh, or something was with it, that there was something with BPF that he wasn't working. I think he said, I think he said to me last time in OSPM that like he's got, oh, he fixed it or something. I don't know if you remember. Uh, yes. Uh, So I imagine you might have several, let's say, instances of these state machines. Are they implicitly associated with a thread, or what's the deal? You could, no, okay, so yes, you could have several things. So when you register, when you hook the state machine up, like the one thing about trace points is you could have multiple callbacks. So for on the tracing side, I could have ftrace reading the sked switch, you know, LTTNG could read the sked switch, Burf could do it all at the same time. It just creates an array and just does a bunch of callbacks. Same thing here, if you had like, 10 state machines, it would actually be individual, I believe, right? There, you could individual state machines when you put in there, and it just, it's, it only cares about what it hooked to. So yes, you can have multiple state machines going at the same time, hooked to the same trace points. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering, like, so in the binder driver, I, I could see some places where you could have a state machine per process using the binder driver. That could be the case, but now the only thing is you have to watch out for, which is talking about performance-wise. If the thing is like it is a it, like when you like you said the uh, trace point is a no-op when there's nothing hooking to it. Of course. When you have um, 
uh, I, I don't know, you probably want to do measurement. It matters how many trace points you have, but if you have something hooking to it, and then you, you say per process, and now suddenly you have, you know, uh, I, well, I guess it, it won't know, the trace point won't know that, oh, uh, only call this guy because I'm running this process. If you have 20, I, I, I would believe that if you have a state machine where you say only care for this process and you have them all hooked to the, like, say 20 processes hooked to uh, the state machine, it's going to do a callback tw to all 20 guys and only one of them is going, all of them would say, I don't care. It's going to do kind of filtering. It's going to get the callback saying, oh, I, I don't care about this, boom. Now what we probably should probably do in that case would be, um, if this is the infrastructure we do, maybe we do the multiplexer in there so it only registers, um, you have a single, uh, uh, let's see, the runtime verifier, you, you register the runtime verifier, the runtime verifier registers like oh, one uh, callback from the function. So that way it can multi, it will know, oh, this thread only cares about this and says, on this thread, call that guy. So it doesn't do a callback to all 20 of them and each one says, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. So we probably would need, like that's how like, uh, K probes hooks to like doesn't like or not like stuff like uh, or at least for function tracing for function tracing and stuff like that usually you just uh, the function like you just have K probes that uh, if you have two K probes like function graph tracing if you have like two function gra or two K probes that's going to look at two different functions it will register a single callback and the K probe mechanism does the thing yes oh um, microphone. <laughs> so why don't we are, uh, what's it, that are save that are the state machine uh, uh, per task so that are, we can uh, make a, uh, what define that are uh, per system, uh, what's the system wide uh, automaton and also per task automaton uh, because that are. Uh, <coughs> I might be wrong, but I think there are um, at least three different monitors type. There is a per CPU, per task, maybe already. So that's probably already uh, possible. Uh, I, I think, again. <laughs> Hello, I'm Matthias from Red Hat. And uh, I think you can use, you can generate the dot files from a simple language, for example, if you want this to describe the state machines. I mean, there are thousands of languages to describe the machine. And uh, we were discussing about this with Daniel three years ago, actually. <laughs> and also, what I'm planning to do, I'm not sure yet, but uh, I wanted to use the runtime verificator for, for, um, for Virtio drivers. Because in Virtio, you have the specification, you have things that you can model with state machines, so it's just about to write a runtime verification, verificator to uh, detect violation of the spec. So you, there are situations that could be modeled with state machine, not everything, but at least a part. Uh, I'm going to present something later about that, an issue that we found that potentially could be, I mean, detected with the, with the runtime verificator. So that is my plan at least. Let's see where I go. Oh, oh wait, oh, we have, whoa, Al, hold on a second, Alexander's in there, uh, yes. Okay, Alexander, you could. Uh, yeah, yeah um, I'm using it already, but uh, my use case is not very in for production. I'm using it more for testing that uh, if I do some changes for my uh, logging subsystem, that the logging correctness is still valid. And uh, there, where I was introducing not a pair um, task struct um, verifier, I was introducing for a pair lock verifier. And then I can, but I was doing it uh, that, uh, that uh, I was able to see if uh, exclu exclusive, uh, exclusive lock was used at the same time. And, and then I panic or I put a message out. That, that's what uh, I'm currently doing. But uh, I, I would like to have some way to, OK, when I panic or I print something out, I know I got into an invalid state of my um, 
automaton, which I was describing in in, in dot, but um, then the way how I was going into this state that would be interesting to debug afterwards. Yes, one comment on this, uh, Alexander. Uh, hello, my name is Giovanni. Uh, I'm normally matching uh, things I heard at uh, talks, so I am not. I never use the Linux kernel memory model by Paul McKenney and co-authors, but for verifying the correctness of locking, that uh, is at least uh, described as the the tool. Uh, so it has uh, what they call litmus test. Uh, so you. Um, it doesn't take your source code. You have to um, extract the essence of the locking that you are uh, uh, doing. You have to write it in some, uh, uh, it's not pseudocode, it's a different, uh, a small, smaller language uh, similar to C, and then you run it uh, uh, um, through the tester, which uh, has um, a implementation of the Linux kernel memory model, and it kind of uh, and it, it does a, an a, a exhaustive exploration of all the possible states, and it will tell you all the things that could happen. So for locking, the Linux kernel memory model seems uh, more uh, specific uh, to this case. Uh, it's in the kernel. Uh, there is a, I just wanted to say, you want probably to Google li LKMM, Linux kernel memory model. Oh, okay. Uh, can you go back to the slide where you have the state machine? Because your explanation was completely wrong. So I just okay. want to go back to there. <laughs> so I've just looked at the code, and I was oh. like, waking does not do that. OK, oh. so what it validates is that sked waking is always called with preemption disabled. Oh. So in try to wake, wake up. Wake and preempt, OK, you're right. Yeah. So, so in try to wake up, there's a preempt guard first, and then it does all the sked waking calls. That's what it validates. It has nothing to do with schedule with preempt off. That's the opposite. I think the thing was like when we first did this, I actually talked to him about doing that, and he's like, "Oh yeah, it could be done." And then I just was assuming that it's, I didn't actually go back and look at the code. <laughs> Two points on the on the validating the locking. Uh, depends on what you want to validate, I think, because the, as far as I understand, the, the memory model thing validates if you have like race conditions or if you're using your barriers not the right way. Um, for example, one thing, uh, an additional uh, use case I was thinking of, uh, it, this is related to the proxy execution discussion that we had yesterday. So for SCAD deadline, for, for example, uh, the moment you implement a locking mechanism that does the priority inheritance, uh, you have, for example, for RT mutexes, you have the lock, uh, lock depth, of course. So um, that validates that you actually have, I uh, mean, you're expensing the dependency, right? For deadline, you actually um, have to respect the temporal isolation among tasks that the theory that actually tells you how to, what's the property you want to validate. And I think that's uh, fitting more with the RV. And I don't think that's something you can do with the uh, memory model thing. So it depends on what you want to validate. And that's another use case. And going back to the overhead, uh, I think, so you mentioned that Daniel essentially proved, uh, used this for validating the scheduler and the uh, pre preempt RT essentially, and it was saying that uh, the, the overhead for doing that was really low. So I think it's no, essentially well, you yes, it's very. Uh, my worry was if you have 20 callbacks, uh, like I said, if you have, well, I mentioned like having a per process. Uh, right. Yeah, it depends on how you, you use it. That means you have yes, 20 but, validators. Yeah. You know, yes, it could be very slow. Maybe, like you said, it only adds maybe, uh, you know, maybe, a, uh, like I said, um, Let's say if it adds 100 or let's say five uh, microseconds, but if you put 20 in there, yeah, yeah, I guess it that adds up you... quite a bit. Mm. So uh, Alexander, did you, you raise your hand? Did you uh, have anything? Yeah, it's just that uh, my my use case is very special because I'm I'm verify here a distributed log manager, and uh, yeah, I don't. But I'm doing, of course, I'm not validating my own source code. I'm only having trace point to the actual user calls. And then I um, simulate everything over net namespaces to have each node acting like this. That is uh, that I see a global view about my network. 
that's very connected with my previous talk with distributed tracing. I'm doing that currently with net namespaces and then I'm validating it. I'm I'm not sure if I can use logdap or something like that for this right now. When anyone but, leaves, uh, you know, I forgot to do my beginning uh, obligatory uh, selfie. So everyone smile. I'll, get, I'll do it both sides here. Smile. Yep, I should have done your camera. Yes, actually, let's do it. Okay, so this is, okay, there's a story of the reason why I use a camera is I've been doing this since uh, 1984, uh, doing this with the old yellow Kodak cameras. And he actually has a film camera. <laughs> so the idea is to do this with the actual film camera so you don't get a second chance or a validate that where you get. So everyone, so everyone smile. Wait, is that fun? This actually has a focus. It's like not. It's a manual focus. Okay. Smile. There we go. Feel closer. Okay. 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 Okay.